Right then. Where where are you? Is that your is that your room that you uh, that you write in? Yes, uh, otherwise known as my office. <laughs> yeah, that is another word for a room that you might work in. <laughs> I um, yeah, it's always a fascinating insight when I speak to writers of music books, especially ones that I've read as. Uh, as comprehensively as the books that you've done uh, to see where the, the magic is made, so to speak. <laughs> I wrote, uh, I did write Our Band Could Be Your Life in this room. Oh, I see. Now you're talking. Now you're talking. <laughs> do you know, do you know how many, do you know how many copies I've, I've bought of that book? I, I, I'm, I'm in double figures in, <laughs> in, in Sunland. I used to live in Sunland. Do you know Sunland in the North of England? No. Uh, it's near Newcastle. It's a city up, 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 up top of the country, and I was mm -hmm. at university there. And I moved there when I was eighteen, and I was so. So, what year? What year did that book come out? Was it two thousand? Two thousand and one. Okay, so when I moved up there, I so it was nineteen ninety eight, and I was like drunk on punk and DIY, and you know, just a kid that just wanted to, almost kind of wanted to have. I wanted a punk, like I wanted to be at the heart of something like that. And when that book came out, we were quite far into that. You know, we were putting shows on and I was in a band and there were some other bands that went on to be quite notable in the UK. And, you know, we really were kind of living the punk rock dream. And when that book came out, we just all devoured it and we would just pass it around and, you know, it'd be like, can I have my copy of the book back? Go on, no. I've lost it, but they haven't really lost it, and you just go buy another one, you know. So it was very, it was very seminal on a whole, a whole bunch of people. I knew that book. Oh, that, okay. Well, that explains a lot because there was a real, a huge uh, sales boom around that time uh, in the north of England. And that yeah. that would explain it. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was all me. I, I will happily take responsibility for that. Th thank you. So. So what you've done to the Nirvana book, I think that's fascinating, actually, going into the guts of something you wrote so long ago and, mm. like, not so much updating it, but, like, annotating your own work. I think that's really almost doing a remix of your of, of the original work. Uh, I think I know the answer. I always find this weird when I speak to people who have written books because you're sort of trying to not give too much away or just repeat what you've written in the book back at you. But for the benefit of people watching Stroke, listening to this, why did you do that? Uh, well, uh, first, I would say I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that the the amplified "Come as You Are" is a is a remix so much as a um, like a director's commentary on a DVD. Okay. So you can follow the original, and then tap into uh, you know the the director's uh, or actor's insights uh, from often many years later. So, uh, you know, that's kind of the gist of the Amplified Come As You Are. There's a, a, a paragraph from the original book, maybe, uh, maybe two paragraphs. And then there's something that I just had to interject there. And uh, so I'm in a dialogue. Uh, my my 60 something self now is in dialogue with my uh, 30 year old self. And uh, it started, as uh, so many things have lately during the pandemic, I it's just one of those things I'd always meant to say something about a specific little passage in Come As You Are uh, about uh, Kurt sleeping under the bridge and that I suspect that's apocryphal. Other people uh, who are in a very good position to know believe it. it is entirely possible that Kurt slept under the bridge. But I uh, wanted to just say something about that and just say something about the journalist subject relationship. And so I just wrote down a you know few paragraphs and thought maybe I'd put it up on my blog and provide a link to it and whoever was interested in such a thing <laughs> could uh, could go and, and read it. But then I, I wrote that and it was kind of satisfying to get that off my chest like, wow, maybe he you know he bamboozled me there. And he was do, just doing some classic old rock and roll myth making. But um, I thought, well, maybe there's something else to say about other things in the book. So I turned to page one. And sure enough, there was something I really wanted to say <laughs> about something on page one. And I wrote that down, turned the page, 
Oh, I got something to say about that too. (laughs) And then uh, two years later, I'd gone through the entire book (laughs) and I told my agent about it. And, um, and he said, you know, you could probably sell this. And I didn't, um, you know, that was uh, in, uh, in UK parlance, a gobsmacker (laughs) uh, to me. I had not expected that, but we, we shopped it around and um, a very long and complicated story cut short. uh, The book is out now. I, I, I think it's really interesting. I mean, I'm very interested as a writer in books about writing. I know it's very niche, but I, I, I am interested in that. And I, I have OCD. I talk about that on the podcast all the time. And I do have real, you know, diagnosed OCD, and things not being as, things not feeling right cause me a lot of distress. So I have a bit of a thing in my writing where um, it's really hard to let it go. Like it's really hard to 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 put to put a bow on it, and uh, I've had to do a lot of work on that. And I thought that when I thought like the idea of what you've done here, I wondered if you'd had a similar kind of nagging. I would like to tweak this. I would like to comment on this, which is almost like what you were saying, but how long did you have those, did you have those thoughts over the 30 years since it had been published? Um, there's a, there's a quotation from the novelist and I think essayist, uh, Italo Calvino about how everything you write, there's always something you regret or wish you could change. And, um, I think every writer has this funny little syndrome where the moment you hit send or, you know, the, the book is set in stone, suddenly you have this moment of clarity and you realize all these things that you want to change. And you can only reach this clarity after you've hit send or your editor says, okay, it's a lock. (laughs) This is what's getting published. And that is, um, you know, that's just writerly psychology. And yes, you know, there were things that I wanted to fix and, or expand on uh, ever since the book came out. And so uh, the Amplified Come As You Are does, you know, indulge that, uh, you know, very common authorial uh, neurosis. And I, I'm, I'm very thankful that I had the luxury to to indulge it. So, like, so Nirvana were, I mean, I'm sure you've heard people say this many times before but nirvana really were life-changing to me i was uh i was 14 when kurt died and it set me on a path that i've never really left but i'm also kind of very aware that me being 14 when like like i i wasn't i didn't have a ticket but my friends at school they had uh they had a ticket to see nirvana in arenas in the uk on the tour that got obviously cancelled and so I never saw Nirvana, basically. And when mm. I, people I know who are five years older had seen Nirvana play club shows, I, I never had that experience. So in so many ways, my Nirvana fandom was influenced by the commentary around his death and almost like the, to be a bit icky about it, the kind of martyrdom, really, that existed in that era of Kurt. And also just all of the... Um, just all of the, as you sort of say, the sort of rock and roll myth making that kind of followed in, in, in so many ways. When I was perusing the amplified version of the book, it really helped me remem- remember what I had felt about Nirvana at the time that has maybe been, uh, maybe been diluted by Camden Market t-shirt prints with him looking forlorn on the uh, on the front of them and so on you know it i reconnected with kurt to a de- to a degree mm. i wonder what that was like as well when you were going back into it because you know you were there and you were given access you know un- unparalleled access to 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 him and to the band what what was it like kind of going back there given that there is almost a kind of a brand like a Kurt Cobain brand for want of a better term now. Um, I mean, you, you, you asked me earlier about, you know, why I wrote the book. And another reason was just to, 
And you also mentioned how Nirvana was life changing for you. Um, Nirvana was life changing for me too. Um, you know, musically, of course, and culturally, and everything. But also, just having written the book, it really altered the course of my life. That whole experience, and and then Kurt's death was, you know, was very very difficult. And there's something about suicide, especially uh, that sort of death, that really. Uh, scars people who were close to to that person and uh, people are trying to figure you know people try to figure out what happened <laughs> why you know why did it happen and what if any part did I have in it or could I have could I have done something and a lot of the amplified come as you are is also just me uh, trying to make sense for myself and for the reader, what happened? And it's um, sometimes I, I take it head on, and then there's a lot of material in there that um, is seems tangential, but I, I hope will kind of add up to a bigger picture of uh, of how and why Nirvana happened, and how and you know and why uh, Kurt uh, did what he did. So, yeah, a lot of it is just trying to make sense of things. Yeah, well, I think there's something fairly... I mean, that comes across from the the, the new intro uh, of the Amplified version. I mean, it's so interesting to me because I, I've, I've had some mental health issues in my life, and I feel like my generation in so many ways are... are you know, I'm sort of just after Gen X, I guess, sort of Xennial, I believe they call it. But <laughs> I, f I feel like so much of our generation, of my generation, was um, our language around, if, if you're into music, uh, our, our language about mental health and depression and, you know, as I said, I have OCD, like, was, was shaped largely by that experience and the coverage. Like, in lots of ways, I remember reading, you know, because I read the music press more than I read you know, books, you know, at that point in my life. And I remember reading about there was often this kind of propagated uh, idea that there was suicide in the Cobain family and that how suicide was genetic and actually doing quite a lot of reading about uh, about suicide sub subsequently with my own experiences. It feels like the consensus, consensus of that kind of flips back and forth. So it's kind of weird, like, was it hard to see... Was it hard, as someone who knew the guy, was it hard to see, was it hard to read and hear so much, I don't know, sort of, so much kind of confused commentary on that event in the wake of it happening? Um, yes, uh, um, a, a lot of it, you know, was a lot of speculation uh about someone they didn't know and it, there's even you know even psychiatrists have this hard and fast rule not to diagnose someone they haven't personally consulted with um and so if psychiatrists shouldn't do it then journalists surely should not yeah um there were a few journalists who knew uh kurt quite well i i would think they're they'd be well entitled to uh, speculate, but um, there, I I mentioned this in the amplified come as you are, but there's a a scene in um, I think it's Annie Hall, the Woody Allen movie, where he's he's on a movie line and there's someone in front of him just kind of pompously pontificating about the um, cultural theorist from the '60s, Marshall McLuhan, and um, Woody Allen is just growing visibly upset about how clueless this blowhard is and finally he pulls in marshall McLuhan <laughs> into the frame and, and McLuhan uh, says to this blowhard on the line sir you have absolutely no knowledge of my work <laughs> and um you know and i wish you know amid all that speculation about about kurt and his relationship with courtney um by people who had never met the man I, I wish I so many times I wished I could have pulled Kurt into the frame and have him tell them that they didn't know what they were talking about. So yeah, that was that was a frustrating time. 
there was something extraordinary in that intro, intro as well. I, I, I have so much respect for you for putting, although it really did floor me when I read it. There's a bit where you're, you're almost, I don't know, not, not critiquing, but you, you've been very honest about what you perceive as your flaws as a journalist. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that, you know, you, you feel like that you have a tendency almost to not, to kind of look away from some of the heavier stuff. Yeah. And I just, I just thought that was like a, I thought that was a really honest, brave thing to say, but also kind of really sad given the context of suicide and how any mm. of us who've lost anyone, we do think, could we have done anything differently? And mm. I just wondered how you felt when you when you wrote that and, and, and how much you do feel like that, because I'm not sure, having read your other work, I would necessarily say that you were someone who did shy away from from um, from the gnarlier stuff. Um. Uh, well, you may not know how much gnarly stuff I left out <laughs> of those other things. <laughs> um, but also, uh, uh, if you're referring to Our Band Could Be Your Life, I mean, that book was written probably, what, eight years later or something like that. So, you know, I would uh, progressed in my life, maybe. Um, yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, that's just a tendency I have. But also... You know, the the subtitle of the original book is The Story of Nirvana. And I grew up on reading rock books, you know, about rock bands. And none of them really got into the really gossipy aspects of the band members' private lives. I, they were just about the band and how the band worked and how they made their music. And that's what I, I really wanted to know about Nirvana. And I, I kind of... A, uh, bet that that's what most fans at the time wanted to know about Nirvana. In retrospect, all the dark, gnarly, you know, gossipy material uh, looms very large, but that's in retrospect. At the time, there were some rumblings about heroin use and, you know, domestic discord and things like that. But mostly at the time, Nirvana was just a, a world changing rock band. And people wanted to know who were these people and how did they make their music you know and so at that in that moment it didn't make sense to chase down some of the darker personal corners of of the band and re again in retrospect you know hindsight is 2020 but i'm telling you you know in, the, in late 19, 1992 to mid 1993 it that just wasn't as important I went to I went to see Keith Cameron do a talk recently about his Mud Honey book, and mm. and I also I worked at the Enemy for years, so I, I sort of knew rumblings of this, and there was always this there was always this um, sort of scuttlebutt around UK music journalism about how Keith had kind of been ostracised from the Nirvana camp because he'd told the truth, and however it true hadn't been because he kind of um well he he wasn't as stark in his telling of uh, of the inner machinations of the nirvana camp as, as keith had been and you know that's for that's for someone else to adjudicate or what have you but i wonder i wonder a what was your process in thinking okay well almost like you, how you would keep what you wanted to achieve with the book, which was to tell a great rock and roll story, yeah. and how much was, oh, I need to tell the truth about this, especially because you do confess in the intro to the new version of the book that in many ways you were kind of brought in, even if it wasn't said explicitly, to, do a, to almost do a PR job, in a sense, for the Cobains. Um, maybe, um, the, the context for all this is that, uh, Kurt and Courtney had recently lost, uh, custody of their child, uh, which is a very, uh, devastating thing. Um, uh, I'm sure <laughs> Yeah, I can't even begin to imagine what that must be like. And so they were very, uh, keen on presenting themselves as responsible parents uh 
I think, uh, you know, there were clearly substance abuse problems there still, but they were they were making a, a good faith effort to try to stop. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to quit doing heroin, especially when you have a lot of uh, uh, aggravating factors around you. So uh, I'm not sure I would, I wouldn't say it was, you know, I was supposed to do a PR job, but I, I think, think they I, realized I, that I think when they I realized said that, that I was a fan of the band, you know, and, yeah. I, and I wanted to write a fan's eye view of the band. Yeah. I, and, I, I guess it was, I guess I was being a bit, as, as I said, those words, I thought James, you've been a bit blunt there, but I, I think it was having read that intro and you, you you almost sort of like breaking the almost kind of like breaking the wall you were quite meta about it and confessing what you would thought like you'd almost thought oh well what's this motive what are their motivations why me well i i think why me was because um i had written a, a rolling stone cover story on um on nirvana earlier that year and um, that was the famous cover uh, with Kurt wearing a T-shirt, homemade T-shirt that said corporate magazines still suck. Yeah. And I had just uh, connected with him. Uh, we come from very different backgrounds. Um, I'm a little older than he was, just not much, but a little older. And um, but somehow I understood him and and he understood me. And we had a really great conversation there. And then in the Rolling Stone story, uh, well, I, I, I think I was the first to connect his childhood with the sound of his music, uh, for one thing. But, um, but I uh, respected uh, his love for Courtney. I mentioned that he was really in love with Courtney, who was just starting to get a lot of abuse in the press. And um, he, uh, he said something about how bad it is to, to do drugs and I duly uh, quoted him on that, and he, I think he was very pleased about that. And there were, um, we talked about uh, bands that he really liked, and I know he, he appreciated my including that um, because that was a way of, you know, I think all everyone in the band uh, coped with their fame by, um, by plugging other bands. So uh, Kurt and I had connected during that interview, and I think... That's a big reason why I, I got the call one night in uh, November of 92, asking if I'd like to write a book about Nirvana. There's, there's the bit where you say that he said that, I can't remember whether, he, whether Courtney had passed this on, but how almost he'd recognise the melancholy in you. Yeah. Um, I think that's so... I've had a few people I've interviewed over the years, uh, musicians who turned the tables and sort of almost done a sort of psychological assessment of me. And mm. I think it's I think it's interesting. I think the work that you can produce as a writer is really good when there is that. Um, but how was that to hear? Did, did you think that he was accurate? Oh, yeah. No, there's no question that he was accurate. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's part of that. Uh, connection that I spoke of. And I would hasten to add that that connection that I had with Kurt, uh, I'm sure probably literally tens of millions of other people would have felt. I, I just, uh, he was, you know, a very uh, extraordinary, ordinary person. And that's a lot of what I tried to convey in Come As You Are, that um, these people from three people from very, very relatable backgrounds, especially for American kids of a certain generation, could make something magical. And that maybe that would inspire other people to uh, to try to make something magical. I was asking before about you, I re regret is the wrong word, but you having, thinking, oh, well, if I could go back into it, I would do that. I also unquestionably feel that you were very hurt and upset and confused by the, the horrible way that that band ended. So there's almost part of me wondering how 
could could you have gone back in before b before the did you need the 30 years to feel like you could go back in there or w when did you feel like you could have done that when did you feel like you'd recovered from that experience mm. well um i i think that writing the book was part of the recovery and that that was in fact that was the recovery yeah uh, i'm not sure i'm you know completely recovered um I, like i say you know if you know someone who has committed suicide it, it just it does scar you forever and you know uh, there were plenty of people who were far closer to kurt than i was and i can only imagine uh how they feel um you know every day probably so yeah that the you know the the act of writing the book was a you know a kind of a self-healing thing and like i say it was written during the pandemic when when people were doing things that they kind of put off um yeah, yeah. or you know you know while so while other people were perfecting their sourdough recipe or learning italian i was uh trying to figure out for myself uh, what happened with Nirvana and Kurt Cobain? Yeah, because this is the thing. I think that you know, I, I don't know what it's like in the states, but there's there's always a conversation in British music journalism about how much the writer should be within what we write, and I, and I can see arguments in both ways. I, I always come to a place of you know, if we are trying to serve music fans, then our then our fandom is important. But I also have read some very bad first-person music writing, so I feel like it's a um, it's a balance. But I I do feel like with these projects, I certainly know that on this podcast, I'm always trying to get to people who mattered to me when I was younger. And I think on some kind of psychological level, that is that's about me. That's about me wanting to connect with the person that I was when I was younger or you know pop in and say hello to that teenager that that felt a certain way about the world so that thing that you just say about almost this being part of the process for you is interesting the um yes uh you know uh, i i don't know who said this or maybe it's just a little uh paraphrase of something oscar wilde may have said but um I fervently believe that all biography is autobiography. And, um, you know, because you're, if only because you're seeing the story through your own frame, your own lens. Yeah. yeah. But um, I, I did emphasize the, for instance, uh, the effect that his parents' divorce had on Kurt uh, because I was, you know, that same thing happened to me. And um, I reacted in a very similar way to Kurt. And again, I think that's something that he he picked up on. And I meant to say that, you know, the fact that he noted that melancholy that I have um, is um, just a great example of his, his empathy and profound sensitivity. The guy um, uh, could pick up, you know, every signal in the room. And I think it really, people like that uh, tend to be driven a little mad by that and a lot of other people can't understand how someone could ha even have that facility but but they do they really feel the feelings of everyone in the room and it's it's kind of torturous so he he had that gift um which didn't mean that he didn't act insensitively um from time to time uh but he did have that that sensitivity um the uh you know i i was you know raised professionally speaking in a pretty formal way so there was nothing uh i i up until now i'd written virtually nothing in the first person because that's just not what journalists do you you are supposed to ideally you you step out of the story you're not part of the story yeah and um i i actually wrote one thing before this that was first person it was about a a a band called tube lord who wrote a song called i am azarad <laughs> and the chorus was i'll kill you azarad so i had to write something about that yeah and actually had a really great chat with the singer um uh, that was for spin some years ago so 
Uh, that was really the first time I wrote in first person professionally. And uh, so, uh, but I realized, you know, really, you know, not long after the book came out that I, you know, I was part of the story. I, I you know, sometimes I witnessed part of this parts of the story. And, um, and this thing happened to me. And I thought, but that by sharing my experience with the Amplified Come As You Are, that I could shed some light on um, uh, what it's like to be a journalist, the, the journalist subject relationship. And, um, and also, uh, you know, going through something as traumatic as knowing someone who kills themselves. How are you, do you still have a relationship with Courtney? Um, not particularly. It, I, we're not, you know, we're on good terms, but it's, not like I call her up and ask her how she's doing all the time. Yeah, no, I just wondered. I just wondered if you'd had any feedback from the from the major players um, in the wake of finishing this version of the book. Um, no, um, I haven't. Um, although uh, several members of the Seattle music community, people who were very close to Nirvana. Um, have contacted me separately and said how much they love the book. And wow, that means so much. I mean, yeah. uh, these are people who are right in there. Um, and um, uh, that was really validating and frankly a relief because I, I take a lot of chances in that book. Yeah. And uh, for them to, to you know, give the, give the book uh, their seal of approval was meant a whole lot. Do you, I mean, how would you ever know this, but do you feel like you're not as a fan, but as a, as a journalist stroke critic, do you feel like you're done with Nirvana now? Hmm. No, I, I, I just, I don't think I'll ever be done with Nirvana. You know, that, that whole, that experience, like I say, it was life changing and, um, and, you know, pretty kind of traumatic, um, and um and that will stay with me forever i mean and i i mean i don't think i'm really done with anything i've ever done you know in a yeah. way you know, the, yeah. uh, your 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 experience from moment to moment is informed by all the experiences beforehand so uh it, but in terms of you know doing any major projects involving nirvana likely not but who knows <laughs> you know it's, who knows maybe some new technology will arise that will enable something really interesting to be made i i don't know has anyone, has anyone, has anyone ever told you that you're quite a wise man mike lazarad you keep spitting these truth bombs i, I feel like <laughs> i feel like i'm uh, i feel like i'm getting more from you today than i have done for my therapist for a while <laughs> uh I uh, I don't, I'm not sure uh, how wise I am. Although that actually reminds me of uh, the the second musician I ever interviewed was Mark E. Smith, and uh, I was so new to the game that I had no idea that he was a notoriously cranky interview. Yeah, and we had a great chat. We had a really good interview, <laughs> and at the end he kind of he took a breath and he said, "Wow." I feel like I've just been to the psychiatrist. <laughs> and I said, oh, oh, man. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And he said, no, no. Feels great. <laughs> and he said, hey, Bricks, come here. Talk to this guy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, maybe uh, yeah, maybe that's a, a trait that I have that I'm not really aware of. I mean, you know, I'm just me. I have no objectivity about myself. My, uh, Marky Smith was uh, one of two two musical acts that i ever chickened out of interviewing i was supposed to <laughs> i was supposed to interview him and i i remember one morning waking up and being like i i, I just don't think i can do this because i loved the fall and i, I was so sure that he was gonna uh, be a dick yeah that i was like i just i just don't want to put myself through this and i got someone mm. else to do it which i always felt a bit bad about but um <laughs> anyway anyway um with can I ask you a couple of questions about uh, our band? Sure. Well, I've always wanted to know this. Did you have, when you, because obviously it, it, it deals with 
the individual stories of many different bands. Was, was there any bands that you wanted to put in there that you didn't? And did you have to whittle down a list for who made the cut and who didn't make the cut? Um, no, I, I really, I, I, I just thought it through and the, um, the selection process was partially or largely based on geography. I just thought about what were the big, what were the cities with the big indie scenes and yeah. who was the representative band from each one. And, um, so it wasn't like I, you know, started writing a chapter about one of the bands and just abandoned it or, or something like that. I, I just thought it through and then I worked up the list and I said, okay, here's the 13 bands that I'm going to write about. And I was off to the races. Uh, have you ever been tempted to reissue it with more chapters? No, no, I think, uh, it should just, it's, it, I think it stands just fine as it is. Um, you know, if 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 there are you know people who uh, if there are people who feel that some bands got left out, um, they should write a book about that band. You know, <laughs> they should do it themselves. You know, I did my book. Now you do yours. Yeah, but you do know that if you were to do it and update it and add some extra chapters, then I would buy twenty copies, pass them around my friends in Sunderland. They would lose copies. Then we would buy more. I mean. Think of the think think of the Wonga. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's there's something there's things that are more important than filthy lucre, and that's uh, you know, artistic integrity. Yeah, I feel I, like I, I feel I'm, like if I'm we can take that. I feel like if we can take one if we can take one uh, one consensus from the Nirvana story, it is probably that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. That um, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm I'm. Just I'm pleased with that book as it is, you know, I, um, there's a, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I, I, I don't, I don't think it's broke. <laughs> it's definitely, it's definitely not broke. Um, Michael, I'm so, I'm so enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for dishing. Uh, thank you for spewing wisdom at me. I'll, I'll put the, the check in the post. My, my, ther <laughs> my therapist rates are about 120 quid. So I'll, I'll do the conversion and uh, <laughs> whack it over. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for speaking to me, but also for repopulating that book because I think it is an outstanding rock book about probably the best band ever. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, thank you, James. It was a really great chat. Amazing. I appreciate it. Speak to you again. See you. Yeah, dude. great.